Hello. I just did my live presentation and failed to record it. So those of you getting the replay, this will be a little different. Or if you watch the first one, and you're coming back to it again. Who knows? I may say some things that are a little bit different. I don't know because I failed to record. But here I am now finally recording and I am going to share my screen with you and go through this presentation for you. And I'm really excited and I'm grateful that you signed up and thank you for watching this replay. So let me go here and share with you this all about healing your relationship with money. That's what this presentation is about. So thank you for being here. I am Becky. I'm a mindset coach because I don't have a better term for what I do. Um, I don't love the term mindset coach because I think it's been used by people who be, exhibit a lot of behaviors that I don't want to do with my coaching, but I don't have a better term for it. So that's what I do. Um, my business is called The Gutsy Boss. My pronouns are she, her, and I live in St. Louis, Missouri. My mission in life is to smash patriarchy, but that's obviously a big goal. Um, but I do try to chip away at that wall of patriarchy bit by bit by helping individual women, fems and thems, um, unlearn their patriarchal conditioning and redefine success on their own terms. I'm committed to creating inclusive spaces or learning how to do better when I fail to create them. I am a whole ass person by myself, who also happens to be a wife and a mom. And I'm a Golden Girls fanatic. I know that ages me, but so be it. I love them. And I just watched a bunch of episodes over the weekend and it reignited that flame of love for those ladies. When you guys signed up for this, I asked you why you signed up or what brought you to the point of feeling like you wanted to sign up. And these were some of your responses. And a lot of them were around real money concerns. Some of it's fears, fear of financial failure, but also, you know, people having tough times with money, um, being nervous about their finances, actually going through bankruptcy or not having enough money. There are also a bunch of you that I love that said things like, I want to heal my relationship with money in a loving way. I want to address these limiting thoughts that don't support me and find ways to do things that are supportive. I love that compassionate approach and that's what I'm all about. So we're a great fit. I also had um, quite a few of you, these are just a sampling of the amazing responses I got. It was so impressed how many of you took the time to tell me. Um, but quite a few of them had some things that felt like I'm bad. I'm doing something wrong. I'm humiliated. I feel like a failure. I need to make better decisions. And I want to say if you have those thoughts or ever have, this is the right presentation for you because I want you to release that blame and shame. Have compassion for yourself and say, I did what I knew how. Um, I also loved whoever said I'm too tired of hearing Caucasian men talking about just manifest wealth. Here for that. Ditto. I co-sign and that is why I am doing this presentation today. Um, and also for whoever the sweet folks were who said, I just love your workshops. And there were a couple, there were two of you actually who said some variation on this. And thank you. That means a lot to me. It was very sweet. I appreciate that. Um, Let's dig into the meat of the content here, which is going to be around law of attraction and money mindset and some of the harmful pieces of that. And then how we can hopefully change your relationship with that idea of money mindset. And I want to start out with a brief history of this term money mindset or the idea of money mindset and start in 1877, Helena Blavatsky. She was a Russian occultist who was the first person we know to use the phrase law of attraction. It was not related to money. It was in a book about supernatural spirits. So it really had nothing to do with money, but she was the first person to use that term, which then very soon was used by Wallace D. Waddles in the science of getting rich, which is kind of um, considered, a, you know, sort of the foundational work around uh, money mindset and law of attraction. And that, that led to the book, which if you've ever had anyone recommend Law of Attraction or Money Mindset books to you, they've probably recommended Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. That book is certainly the most famous book on this topic. And this idea of thinking your way into wealth or thinking your way into a better life continued into the 50s, The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale, and the 80s with Louise Hay, who's highly quotable, all of her positive uplifting quotes you've probably seen, and she talks about money and you can heal your life. The real doozy, though, came in 2006 with The Secret by Rhonda Byrne. That was a moment in time. It was lightning in a bottle where it seemed like the entire world was suddenly really interested and focused on manifesting um, and law of attraction. 
And it continues this idea. It hasn't stopped the, you know, all of the talk around money mindset and law of attraction continues. I have the wrong book listed on this. I need to fix that. But in 2017, Jen Sincero, You Are a Badass at Making Money was a huge hit. There's been many, many more. Um, I show you this to say throughout time, what's the commonality? What do we notice that all these folks have in common? And it's the same things that, that all of these people have in common. These are other people who have made lots of money talking about improving your money mindset. And before I go any further, let me say, I'm sure that many of them or all of them are really nice and um, well-meaning people. This is not a, a judgment on individuals, but to say, let's look at this whole picture and what do they have in common? And yes, they're all white. A lot of them are men, they're all white. And more on that in a minute, but first, if you're not sure what law of attraction is, what I'm talking about, this is the definition from The Secret, which is sort of that, like I said, the, the book on the topic. And it's the idea that like attracts like. What you think about, you bring about. The energy you put out, the thoughts that you put out, the beliefs that you hold about money are going to be what dictate how much money you receive in return. And it's pretty common to hear people talking about this today as one of or the only key to becoming wealthy, that thinking like a millionaire is what it takes to be a millionaire. And this is true um, inside of that money mindset world, but like the law of attraction world, but also in really traditional financial education, financial literacy, even people like Dave Ramsey or Susie Orman or many of the other financial educators that come at it from that much more practical standpoint also talk about money mindset, law of attraction. So it's happening everywhere. And even if we remove the law of attraction idea from the financial discussion, we still find some of these same concepts buried inside of the quote unquote American dream. So if you grew up in America like I did or many other Western cult cultures that sort of um, try to emulate or talk about the same, have the same short sort of perspective on the American dream. The idea that anyone can become anything, including incredibly rich. You can have what you want. You can be what you want. If you just believe it enough and you work hard enough that we, we get that indoctrinated into us from a very early age. And here's the problem with all of this. We also live in white supremacist patriarchy, almost the entire globe lives in white supremacist patriarchy. Um, certainly a good portion of the globe. Um, and that is the idea that those at the top of that patriarchal ladder, meaning the more boxes they check, white, male, cishet, able-bodied, neurotypical, educated, the more of those boxes that you check, the higher you go up that patriarchal ladder and the more access you have to power and to wealth and wealth helps create power, so almost one and the same. The more the boxes you check, the higher you are up on that patriarchal ladder. The fewer you check, the lower you are on that patriarchal ladder. And patriarchy, to maintain itself, uses a few tools, one of them being blame. That if you're not rich, it must be your fault. You didn't have the right mindset. You didn't think the right thoughts. You didn't believe enough. You, didn't, um, you had too many limiting beliefs. You didn't work hard enough. And another really powerful tool in patriarchy's tool belt to maintain itself, maintain the status quo is shame. If you're not rich, then there's something wrong with you. How many of us are feeling crappy because we think it's our thoughts that are wrong, that we are broken, that our lack is somehow because we aren't doing enough or worse because we aren't enough. And that is by design. And unfortunately, all of these ideas around money mindset take a complex issue like money and make it seem really simple. Take a complex issue like wealth and make it seem really simple. And that's by design. It's this shiny object over here that's meant to distract you from the truth. And the truth is that white supremacist patriarchy has created very real, very painful, and often insurmountable financial disparities. Uh, this is not meant to be a history lesson, so I'm going to just do a real quick over, like a very, very brief touch point on a few things to say that while we know the 13th Amendment officially abolished slavery in 1865, sharecropping, which was basically slavery by another name, continued into the 40s, 1940s, and many blatantly discriminatory laws and practices continued on paper until the civil rights movement 
100 years after slavery was officially ended, including redlining, redlining, which is that practice of banks preventing people of color from buying a home in certain neighborhoods. Now the 1968 Fair, practice, Fair Housing Practice Act, um, Fair Housing Act banned that practice, but it continues now just more covertly, not as blatantly or on paper. And in addition to all the historic barriers that we know against people of color, there are also have, there have always been historic barriers against women. And as an example, I was born in the 70s. I'm dating myself again. But women couldn't open a bank account or get a credit card without their husband's consent until the 70s, until I was alive. That's not that long ago. Yes, I'm getting older, but it's not that long ago. And well, the Equal, Equal Pay Act of 1963 mandated by law equal wages for men and women doing the same work. We know it hasn't worked. That in practice, it hasn't created equality. 60 years since the law, and you can see here the differences that continue, that persist. And all of this, despite the fact that women earn far more college degrees than men. And also to be clear, this is about women. There's a lot of stats out there about that, but I can tell you that also black and Hispanic men make less than white men. So again, it's about how many of those boxes you check on that patriarchal um, pyramid. The fewer, the less you earn, the more, the more you earn. Because also gay and bisexual men make less than heterosexual men. Trans women lose nearly a third of their income after transitioning. People with disabilities are paid less, significantly less. Um, and I'm sure there are just as many studies out there for any of those boxes I talked about, you know, how much education you have, whether you're neurotypical, I don't have all of those stats, but they're there. And it's consistent over and over again. The farther you are from that, um, from whiteness, maleness, able-bodiedness, you know, all of those things, the farther you are from those, the less you make. And it adds up to a lot of money over a lifetime. Just look at the median wealth of a white family. It is, it is staggeringly higher than that of a black family or Hispanic family. And these gaps, again, for women, because I work a lot with women, women, fems, fems, um, but a lot of stats out there show these wealth gaps between men and women. And look at the differences of what it's costing you over a lifetime. You can find you know, where you may or may not fall on this to find the averages of what that costs you over a lifetime. And again, this doesn't account for ability, education, um, neurotypical, neurodivergency, those kinds of things. None of that's factored in here. So again, these are just rough numbers, at, you know, averages, but when you actually check all the boxes, it could be much more. So it's a lot of money this is costing people over their lifetime. And it hasn't helped in the last year, the pandemic with women having to opt out of the workforce, um, women having to get different jobs, that don't pay as much or don't have as many benefits to be able to take care of the, their children that need work. Um, the types of industries that were affected where there are a lot more women or people of color. So there, this is gonna, this last year has set us even farther back and is going to cost even more real money over a lifetime. And the point that I have in sharing this is that when it comes to wealth, there is a lot more involved than just your mindset. Yes. Money mindset is what you think about money. And yes, it does affect the choices that you make about money, how you spend, how you save. But what doesn't get discussed enough in the money mindset circles is that it is also as, or I would say more importantly, informed by inherited, lived, and collective experiences real experiences and disparities that are not universal. Now, is it possible to over or under earn the averages for your race, sex, gender, ability, education? Of course. But to chalk those outliers success up to mindset only is unfair and it's harmful. And it creates shame for those who have more advantages and can lead to a sense of entitlement. I'm sorry, it, can, it creates shame for those who have more disadvantages and create a sense of entitlement for those who have more advantages. And neither entitlement or shame is helpful or healthy, and neither of things, those things will change these systems. Why does this way of educating about money persist? Well, because it maintains the status quo. 
It maintains white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. And it allows the, these gurus to accredit mindset for their success instead of having to face their own privilege. And I say this as someone who could put their own picture on this slide because I was there. I had a very typical money mindset course that I only stopped offering like a year ago because it became increasingly clear to me as I really was doing my own work around my privilege, white privilege, that I was a part of the problem, not a part of the solution. I was perpetuating so much of the same stuff with the law of attraction, think your way into wealth, BS. And I know for that reason that these people are probably very well-meaning good people. This is not about them you know, sitting in a room with Jeff Bezos plotting and conspiring to keep white people wealthy. But it is much easier to teach other people that the reason they don't have more is because of their mindset than it is to have to face your own privilege. And not until I was able to do the true work of facing my own privilege was I able to shift my approach to this work and I hope others will as well. But beyond the individuals, I will say that more important is that in white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, those at the very top the Jeff Bezos of the world. And again, he might also be a decent human, but those who are benefiting the most, those who check the most boxes, depend on everyone else further down on those rungs, falling in line, taking their place on that ladder. They need you to buy into the American dream and blame yourself for your shortcomings um, and not blame the system. They need you to work hard and spend hard to keep that moving up money moving up the patriarchy ladder. They need you to want more and to never be satisfied and to believe that you have to work really hard to get what you want. It's all by design. And if we all fall in line, the system remains unchanged and those at the top continue to reap the greatest benefit. Now, don't panic. <laughs> I'm not here to say like you have to buy into my feminist utopia, although I hope you do. And I'm not telling you, you have to like become a hippie and live in a van. That's not what this is about. It's not about giving up on your dreams or like giving up at all. My goal is just to help people unpack this patriarchal conditioning, not to opt out of the system because like spoiler alert, we can't, it's not going away in our lifetimes. We can't opt out of the system. Um, I just want to help people reassess and understand what are your true beliefs and what are those that have been given to you or put on you? And how can you begin to redefine success on your own terms? So when it comes to money mindset, then my goal is to help encourage people to, instead of thinking about like their mindset as a problem, instead examining their relationship with money, a holistic perspective on that. So that includes your thoughts and feelings about money, yes. But also, and just as important, it, it includes thinking about your advantages and disadvantages you have related to money. So for white people, that means getting real with how much of your success and that of your ancestors was mindset and how much was privilege. What are the economic realities, the systemic things that were in play that have played in your favor or in favor of those that you admire, even if it's not you, the rich folks that you're trying to emulate? And so I adore Rachel Cargill. If you don't follow her on Instagram, I highly recommend it. And I love her quote that says, maybe you manifested it. Maybe it's white privilege. And that is something that's important for white people to wrestle with. And then for people on the margins, those who check fewer of those boxes, the fewer boxes you check, the more, you know, pushed to the margins you've been. And the more I think it's about examining how much of those rich people that you hope to emulate, how much of their success actually was mindset and how much is privilege. And also, what are the economic realities that create barriers for you and for those who come before you that may not have stood in the way for others? Now, this is not about feeling horrible about yourself as a white person or about being totally discouraged if you were a black or brown person or someone else in the margin. This is about helping people release their feelings of entitlement to money, or more importantly, I think, um, releasing the feelings of guilt and shame and blame that we have wrapped up in the idea that making more money is about your mindset. And if you aren't making more, then it must be because something is wrong with you. So I wanna to talk to you about three things that you can do after today 
that will help you create that healthier relationship with money. And first is unlearning patriarchal conditioning, a lot of what we've been talking about here. The conditioning that has likely given you an unhealthy and unhelpful feelings of entitlement to money a fear of money or whatever way you have those icky feelings about your past, current or future finances. So that means getting a clear picture of the realities and stories about money that have been given to you. Feel free to screenshot this page or write these questions down, pause and write these questions down and use them. These are some of the questions that I use with my clients and that I will be using in the program that I'm gonna be telling you about shortly. So these are some of the things that you can begin to do to do that deeper digging into understanding what beliefs you have and what your actual experience has been with money. What messages did you receive about your ability to have money? Or what messages did you receive about the ability of someone like you, who looks like you or loves like you, your ability to have money, to make money, to hold on to money, to have wealth? That means from your parents, yes, and also from your religion, your, your culture, your society, pop culture, on TV, what messages were you given? Who holds the financial power where you live or in your culture? In what ways do you have or are you denied the same access? And I love the question, being empowered and happy about money would mean what? What would that look like? How would that feel? What would shift? When I've done this, when I did this work for myself, when I did this deep digging into my own um, learned behaviors, my own learned thoughts. I had some stuff that I had to wrestle with that was pretty hard. And I share it because I've heard from people when I have shared it, but it's helpful for them to hear that we can go there and come out the other side of this in a more powerful place, an empowered place. I consider myself a feminist, an intersectional feminist. I consider myself liberal. I consider myself pretty, you know, um, open-minded and um, evolved. And I uncovered that I had pretty strong white entitlement. I learned that someone who looks like me should be able to have all the money they want. I believed that I should have as much money as I want. I never thought I shouldn't be allowed to have that. I should be able to, I should have lots of money. I should have like, it should, of course I should have money, right? I had a real sense of entitlement to money. And at the same time, because of messages I received from my earliest days, I never, all the people I saw who had lots of money had the same color of skin as me. Now, not as many of them were women, but there were definitely women too. And I saw that I, as a white person, could have money, should have money. And in my own personal life, coming through from a long line of codependent women, I also learned that men should take care of me. I fought that, but it got internalized and embedded in there. And so I had these two conflicting messages of I should have all the money I want. Well, sort of conflicting, you'll see. Um, but two messages that I should be entitled to all the money I want and that a man should take care of me. What that ended up looking like was I thought I should be able to have lots of money. And when it got hard for, hard for me to earn it, when times were tough, I thought the man in my life should swoop in and make it easy again should make it so that I have all the money I want, which created a lot of resentment in my marriage that I didn't even recognize as such. I didn't know why I was feeling that way. But when my business might get a little slow, when I was feeling concerned about my ability to bring in income, I make more money in my home, then I would feel resentful towards my husband for making less money, even though I think he's a teacher, noble work. I never, I like in my brain say, of course, it's fine but it would happen and I couldn't understand why I was having these resentful feelings until I did this work to understand that I had been given these messages that I was entitled to have lots of money. And if it got hard, a man should make it easy for me. He should take care of me. Seeing it meant I couldn't unsee it. It was very difficult to see. I cried. There were tears to be had to have to sit with that as a person who thinks of herself as a person who doesn't need a man and who is, you know, better than all of the other white people, right? I'm one of the good white people. I had all of the stuff I had to sit with and feel really uncomfortable about and cry through. But once I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. And it changed the way I showed up in my marriage. It changed how I felt about money. It allowed me to um, 
receive and to deal with the stressful times in a much healthier way. So this work is really powerful and important. And I share that story to say, what we uncover won't always be easy, but the results of uncovering it and getting to the truth, digging deep enough to get to the real truth, not the like, oh, I don't really think I'm um, worthy of money, but getting to the real truth of what that's about can be really powerful. It can be powerful in helping you learn to forgive and accept yourself, learn to forgive and accept others and circumstances. And it's important to do this work from a place of curiosity and not judgment, approaching all of your thoughts and feelings and actions with curiosity and not judgment. I got curious about why I felt the things I was feeling, not judging myself as being bad for thinking that way. And also then validating and loving myself. That meant saying, of course I felt that way. Why wouldn't I? Every message I had received from birth was that I was entitled to money. Everything I had seen exhibit in my life from birth was that men should take care of you. Of course, those things were embedded in me. That doesn't make me bad or wrong. I'm a product of my upbringing, my environment, my culture, of course. So I can, I can love myself through that to say, this does not make me bad. Now that I've seen it, I can begin to change it and deal with it in a healthy way. Next comes redefining. The next step, I think, in this process of creating this really healthy relationship with money is redefining success on your own terms outside of all of this conditioning we've talked about. So how have the messages that you've been given about money influenced your goals and desires? And again, you can write these questions down or take a screenshot and do these on your own time and think through them. But very often, we have some ideas about if I could just make a million dollars, then I'd be happy. happy. Well, what are the beliefs you're holding about money and happiness and the relationship between those two? And what do you know to be true in your own experience? Also, what would enough money really mean? What does that look like? Very often, we just think it has to be a certain amount of money. I have to be, I have to make millions to have the life I really want. But we've never actually sat down to figure out what we really want, why we really want it, what it would cost. And a lot of times we don't need as much money as we thought. The truth is we don't all need to be millionaires to be really happy. And if you want to be a millionaire or need to be a millionaire to finance the dreams of your life, that's also okay. The point is to start thinking more concre concretely about what you want and why and what it looks like to create that. And to think about what is the power you're giving money? Because right now, very often, when we don't know those answers, we are giving a lot of money to power, a lot of power to money that it doesn't need to have in our lives. What do you want money to really mean in your life? And once you have the answers to those kinds of questions, then you can begin to think about what steps you're actually prepared to take to get to that enough number, to have enough money. And it doesn't, it means steps. It may mean things like setting boundaries advocating for yourself in new ways, saying yes, saying no, um, making some difficult changes in your life, you know, what your career choice, you know, working for someone else, demanding a pay increase. There can be a lot of things that you'll have to do. So what are you actually prepared to do to get to that enough number? And how can you do it in a way that feels safe? In all things, I advocate for safety. I want my clients to do things that feel emotionally and energetically safe. I call it playing small because there's a lot about playing big out there, but I wanna be very clear that I don't mean being small or thinking small. You should never make yourself or your dreams smaller for anyone else. What I mean is playing small, the verb, the actions that you're taking, not your thoughts or feelings, your actions. How can you play, go about, pursue your dreams in a smaller way that allows for more safety? How do you go towards that vision, your vision, your redefined vision in a way that feels safety? When we're talking about money, then that means like maybe you invest $100 in the stock market instead of feeling like you have to go all in or put in thousands. Or if you're not even ready for that, then maybe it's just reading an article on how the stock market works, right? Maybe you start that side hustle that you've been dreaming of with just one client instead of like, and do it on the side, instead of quitting your job and going all in, or maybe you just do initial research on how to even start an LLC, right? What are those small safe steps you can take as you think about moving towards your enough number? 
And then the last thing is receiving, learning how to recognize and receive the abundance that life has to offer, no matter your circumstances. And what I'm talking about here is not like the manifestation BS I talked about earlier, like the secret, think it and it'll be. I'm talking about learning to shift your beliefs about um, and your relationship with money to change your quote unquote money mindset in a healthy way that recognizes that there are real world differences between a quote unquote scarcity mindset and actual real lack. And that there are differences between a quote unquote abundance mindset and like, or there's a danger of an abundance mindset and weaponized gratitude. It's learning how to receive in ways that are healthy, opening yourself to receive more without entitlement, guilt, shame, engaging in mindful actions that are focused on reinforcing that new vision of success that you have and using all of the personal development tools that can help you deal with the fear and discomfort that will inevitably come up as you begin to shift your relationship with money. And this piece is important, the action piece. It's not just about thinking your way rich. We have to take mindful actions that are also rooted in reality because we can act our way into believing faster than we can think our way into acting. Now, You've prob you're probably signed up for this and hopefully watching this replay because um, you've read some of the books that I mentioned earlier or followed some of those money mindset folks and you did the stuff and it didn't work. And now you're starting to understand why. You don't want, you want an, you want an approach to this work. You don't wanna just do money mindset in a way that is um, toxic, toxic positivity, spiritual bypassing, gaslighting, white supremacist, patriarchal BS. You want to go at this work in a way that's deeper more meaningful, more realistic, that understands reality, and that is not going to do all of those other things to you, it's not just give you mantras and happy, like think happy thoughts stuff, it's not tell you just to make a vision board. And if that's the case, then I have you. There is another approach, and I'm excited to share with you that that's the money program. It's a three month small group program that's kicking off in two weeks in August. It is designed to help you dig deeper than mantras and vision boards so that you can trade those feelings of entitlement, blame, shame, guilt that you may have around money and trade them for things like acceptance, compassion, safety. Each month in the program, you will get a 90 minute group workshop. And when I say workshop, I mean workshop. It will not be just me talking at you. It will be us workshopping this together to dig into these issues, to go through all of the things that we've talked about here. You'll also have a 30 minute one-on-one -on -one call with me each month to address your specific issues that are going on related to these things. There's gonna be worksheets and journaling prompts to help you and then a Slack space where you will be able to have that supportive group discussion and access to me between our calls as you're doing a lot of this work on your own because a lot of it is on your own. And over those three months, we're gonna dig into each of these areas that I've highlighted today um, on learning your conditioning about money, redefining success on your own terms, receiving money through mindful actions. These are the dates and times. I wanna be upfront with those because I think as a workshop style, it's most beneficial if you can be there live. So I wanna make sure those dates and times work for you. Um, it's the same like second Tuesday of every month at 11 a.m. Central, just like this call was. And so hopefully those are things you can put into your calendar and make. There's the pricing. That pricing is good for a week and then it's going up to $6.99. This is a very low price, $199 a month um, to get one-on-one -on -one time with me and that group program and the ongoing support in between in Slack. And the reason it's so affordable is twofold. One, this is the first time I'm doing this in this iteration. I've done all the components of this program in different ways. It's the first time I'm doing it in this iteration and I wanna make it a little less so that I feel a little less pressure for it to be perfect. Um, that's my own money mindset stuff. And so I just wanna put it at a price where it feels good to me for the first time around. It won't be the slow again. And the second reason is because I did see what you guys had to say about why you're signing up for this today. And a lot of you are feeling that struggle, a real struggle around money. Some of it feels like mindset, but I bet a lot of it is actually real. And I wouldn't want to offer you something like, unfortunately, so much of the money mindset stuff that's out there are thousands and thousands of dollars. And then there's a lot of really gross sales techniques about if you just believed enough, you would buy it. Or the reason the fact that you don't want to spend the money is why you need to spend the money because you have a money mindset issue. I also know there's reality and you have to pay your bills. So I wanna make this something that's very low 
entry point. And if it's not, doesn't feel low to you, that's also okay. This isn't the right time and that's okay. I don't want you to do this if it doesn't feel like something you can afford, if it doesn't feel safe to you, it should. If it feels though like, yes, this is what I want. I want a group where I can dig into these issues. I'm ready to dig deeper. I'm ready to do this work in the way that she's talking about here, not in the like love and light way I've done it in the past. I want to really examine these things and I want to do it in a safe space that feels really supportive and loving and that will help me learn to have more compassion for myself. If that feels great, I would love to have you join me. BeckyMollenCamp.com slash Betsy Money. You can pay once or you can pay in three payments. There's no penalty for paying over three payments. It's virtually the same price. Um, and I'm not going to pressure you. I'm asking you to join if it feels right because I would love to have you there. And if it doesn't, or if you did sign up either way, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a friend. There's my golden girls who I love. And hopefully you have the theme song in your head now. Thank you for being a friend. And I you know I can't see. Follow me on Instagram if you don't already. Send me a message whether you sign up for the program or not. I would love for you to send me a message on Instagram. Tell me what you got out of this presentation today, what you're taking away from this. If you had any insights, I would love to hear from you. Um, so please follow me there and shoot me a message there. And thank you so much for um, your massage here, just so you can see my face at the very end here. Oh, there I am. Um, so you can see me before I go, but I wanted to say thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being in my world. I hope you got something out of this, whether you join the program or not, uh, but I would love to have you there if it makes sense. So thank you and have a great day.